afternoon and welcome to the 10th Sir Richard Stone Annual Lecture. I'm Hamid Saburian, I'm Chair of the Faculty of Economics. It's my great pleasure to introduce Pete Penner as our 10th Sir Richard Stone Lecturer. Pete is currently the Landa Professor of Economics at Stanford and the Gordon Betty Moore Fellow at Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. He received his PhD from Stanford also in 1991. He has held positions at the University of Chicago uh, and the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. He's a fellow of the Econometric Society and a research associate of the uh, National Bureau of Economic Research. He's a consultant for the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and Minneapolis. I might be missing a couple of them. But uh, he has served on the board of the editors of many of our of journals, and from 2000 to 2015, he had an ongoing intergovernmental personal assignment with the Euro U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Sir Richard Stone Lecture Series was instituted about 10 years over 10 years ago to honor the contributions of Richard Stone to economics and to our faculty. Sir Richard was the director of the Department of Applied Economics between 1945 and 55. During his time as the director, DAE, as it was known to us, uh, became one of the top places in the world for research in applied economics and econometrics. Richard Stone was very interested in the question of measuring economic activities, sometimes known as the father of national income accounting. He also made uh, uh, very many important contributions to demand analysis, economic growth, and input-output models. The hallmark of Richard Stone's approach was bringing theory to data and data to theory. This is the thing I know very well. Uh, uh, Professor Plenot Pete specializes in macroeconomics with emphasis on prices, productivity, and economic growth. His research is very much in line with Richard Stone's. A great deal of it has been about measuring economic performance, starting from micro objects firms, individuals. He has published a very large number of top class papers in the very best journals. Uh, it's a, and if you look at his CV, is an example of what every uh, econ department wants to recruit. Just top fives, uh, one after another. Uh, he's particularly well known for carefully bringing micro observations into macro models, for example, calculating marginal productivity productivity of factors using microdata and integrating them into a macro model with firms having uh, different marginal productive factors. Today he's going to talk about firms and growth. Uh, before turning to Pete, uh, let me mention that the talk is going to be for 75 minutes, uh, so we will have 10 minutes afterwards for questions and answers sessions. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here and honored to present the uh, uh, 10th Richard Stone Lecture. Um, the Father of National Income Accounting, that's particularly inspiring to me because um, a lot of my research is trying to understand economic growth, which is an economic aggregate. And if we didn't have national income accounting, we wouldn't have any frame of reference. So it's all trying to explain uh, an object that he helped us understand and create. Um, and a couple other ways that, that uh, well, let, me, let me say, when I, as an undergrad, I was exposed to national income accounting, I just kind of learned it. When I was a graduate student, I started to think about, you know, who came up with this and how did they come up with this? And that's when I was, became awed. I was like, how did they know what to subtract and what to include in GDP and, you know, like the service flow from, from uh, um, capital? I was like, that's brilliant. I never would have thought of that. I would have gotten all confused. Um, and so um, in awe of what he helped create, and there's another key relationship uh, from Richard, Sir Richard Stone to what I'm going to talk about today, which is I'm going to be emphasizing firms' role in contributing to aggregate growth, and the channel is going to be innovation. And one of the key things about innovation that's interesting economically, and all, including from a policy perspective, is a lot of, a lot of idea, ideas of technology are non-rival, um, meaning that same idea that one firm uses, another firm can build on. Um, it can spread, you know, across firms in an economy. That's going to be a, play a, a critical role in the things I'm describing. And what I'm trying to account for in, in terms of different types of innovation will be very much connected to that. 
But I wanted to add um, national income counting is also an idea. It's an idea that is very successful. It's spread. It's a public good that the whole world gets to use. So in that, in that way, it's very much like technology. Non-rival can benefit everyone. Okay, so um, outline of what I want to talk about is first of all, off, I want to motivate you know, why I want to talk about firms and growth, because there's other things you can talk about that are also important to growth. Um, and then, in particular, then I'm going to proceed and try to describe some estimates where I break down the contributions to growth of different types of firm level innovation. Um, I'm going to give you examples of this in a second, but it, just give you the outline creative destruction versus brand new varieties versus incumbents uh, introducing improvements in their own products. And a related topic, once you start talking about that, is, is which firms? So trying to think about how important are entrants um, to growth and how important are, even among incumbents, say the fast growing ones versus the, the slower growing ones. And then the final thing, which I may or may not have the time for, is to talk about to what extent do, are, are all these sources of growth easy to measure? And to what extent are they likely to be captured in the way we pick up um, economic growth and, the, and the data? Okay, so. Um, this is based on a lot, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants because ideas are non-rival, but the closest things are, are several papers I've had with collaborators, in particular Chiang Kai She uh, appears in a couple of these, but also other, other collaborators. Um, okay, so let me say examples of what I mean by creative destruction. Of course, that's Schumpeter, goes back to Schumpeter and long before that, presumably, which is the idea of a new firm, not necessarily brand new to the world, I should say an existing firm or a new firm, it comes up with a new product or service that wipes out an existing firm. Um, but in the process, it's created something better or cheaper. Um, so that's the creative part of the destruction. The destruction is driving out that existing firm, all the job losses associated with that, which might be costly and painful, um, but also the creative part of, of producing something better. And it's easy to come up with examples of those. Um, you know, to use the manufacturing example, mini mills um, were responsible for a lot of the growth, according to paper by uh, Jan de Locker, a lot of the growth in the last 50 years in the U.S. steel industry, um, in, the, in the same process, they drove out a lot of the large plants and a lot of job losses in the bigger steel plants. And there's lots of examples that we as consumers can kind of relate to. I apologize, many of my examples will be more U.S. centric, and, and I think that just reflects my relative uh, confidence in talking about U.S. examples and U.S. data. I thought briefly about trying to venture with uh, um, British examples, but I thought I'd, I'd probably bungle it, so I'm, I'll stick with the examples I know better. So, but, but things like Amazon wiping out um, Borders bookstore uh, chain or electronics chains, and there are many other examples like Apple and Samsung. Well, I'll show you a little bit of data on the Apple in a little bit. But, um, so cases where things came along that were had more variety, higher quality, uh, cheaper, and drove out existing uh, um, existing firms. Or we look at this and it's kind of tempting to say, well, maybe this, this is the thing that drives growth. This is the main contributor. But it's also easy to come up, well, and here's another striking example. I'll give you this one. Netflix versus Blockbuster. Netflix had 9,000 stores in the US um, in 2008. And then within two years, it had zero stores. Well, basically, there's one left. It's kind of a museum. But um, it was basically wiped out by Netflix within, within less than two years. Um, so that's an example where something was more convenient, cheaper, and seemed like an improvement and yet wiped out an existing firm. Okay, so, but it's easy to, if we just tell anecdotes or just tell stories, it's easy to, to come up with examples of existing firms also carrying technological change. If you look at patents or R&D, it's mostly done by existing firms as opposed to firms that haven't even started yet. Often they don't even record in the R&D. Even if you define entrants uh, as those less than five years old, you're still gonna have the vast majority of R&D patenting done by bigger firms, um, or by, by older firms. Um, and it's easy to come up with examples of each successive generation of car models of existing manufacturers. Those are carrying a lot of technological change. Um, generations of, of smartphones, um, of semiconductor chips. I put a question mark on Big Pharma there because I guess a lot of the pattern there is for to buy up innovative small firms. So then you could say there, but there's really the entrance doing the innovation and then the distribution later comes from bigger firms. Um, so I put a question mark there. But the point of these examples is to say we can't just battle with anecdotes because we can come up with examples where existing firms are carrying growth or where new firms through creative destruction were critical for growth. So they're both going on in the economy. We'd really like a sense of what's their relative contribution. Um, there's another wrinkle on this, which is I think it's easy from 
for a lot of us to be captivated by small firms, and say small firms are particularly innovative, and maybe fast-growing firms, and maybe firms that started small and young, as they all do, and got really big. So unicorns in the Silicon Valley um, lexicon. Um, so firms, maybe the ideal then would be firms that, that, that grew like, sometimes they're called gazelles or rockets. They grew really fast and, and became one of the biggest firms in the world in, say, 50 years or less. Um, so is that, is that the key contributor to growth, is firms like this? Do they contribute majority of growth or not? So those are the kind of questions I'm going to try to provide some estimates of. Okay, so one thing you could say, though, is why do we care about this breakdown? Why do we care about, is it kind of uh, um, the tortoise or the hare? Is it the fast-growing um, uh, 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 hare or is it the slow-growing tortoise? And why do we care about this? Well, um, one hypothesis is that firms differ, like entrants are... are um, are, are things that do think, are firms that do things particularly different that tend to benefit other firms. So it's easier to build on a whole new category that entrants create. Um, there are lots of firms entering Netflix space now. You have Hulu, but then you have Disney, Disney, Disney streaming, and uh, there's the, the cable companies. So there's all these people entering the, the streaming industry that could build on that. And that you could also build on incumbents, but people argue. Uh, the incumbents might do things that are more specific to their product line, like, like their particular smartphone line. So an example that Ufuk Akshi likes to cite is that um, patents by incumbent firms are not as cited by other firms as much as patents by new young firms. So that's evidence consistent with, doesn't prove, but consistent with spillovers might be bigger for younger firms or smaller firms. So we might be particularly interested in, are they doing a lot, in which case we might want to subsidize activity a lot, or um, research activity a lot, or maybe not. Maybe they don't contribute a ton to growth. And implicitly, if you had in mind that the key is these rockets that start small, you might want to really worry about how to cultivate rockets. How do you create an environment in terms of, say, venture capital financing or whatever that would make it easier to, for rockets to become rockets. Okay. Um, business stealing is easy to motivate because business stealing means you're stealing profits from another firm, which economists are fine with because we're fine with competition wiping out profits of a of a competitor, but it is true that this means that the incentive to carry out those innovations might be greater than the incentive to carry out innovations like brand new varieties that don't closely substitute for existing varieties out there, or incremental improvements. So from a social planner's point of view, unless external, positive externalities are bigger from creative destruction, you're going to have too much creative destruction done in the economy and not enough of these other types of innovation. And I list a paper by Atkinson and Burstein that has a nice model encompassing all these forces and arguing about what a social planner would like to do. Because um, today I'm going to be more like accounting. I'm going to be more like trying to do a model-based estimate of how much growth comes from these forces, but I'm very motivated by these models where these, these arrival rates of these types of innovation are endogenous. Okay, um, now back to my outline. So first, I want to, again, about why firms and growth. There's other topics we can talk about in growth. So I'm going to start with income accounting. Um, so, uh, in particular, I should say growth accounting. So imagine some mythical aggregate production function. I'll say a little bit more about that, about um, one way in which we might not have an aggregate production function might very much matter here. Let's just start with that and say, imagine output as a function of physical capital, human capital, and then some residual TFP. Um, so the Bureau of Labor Statistics, where, where I had an affiliation for 15 years, as, um, as you just heard, um, they calculate you know, some some, uh, how much growth comes from various sources. So this is growth in output per worker hour in the U.S. over different periods. If you look at the top line, it's saying, you know, the vast majority of growth is unaccounted for by physical and human capital. Um, so physical capital per, per worker hour and human capital per worker hour. So that, that A, that's a re residual measure of our ignorance. That says we have a lot of work to do netting out physical and human capital. That's on average. The other rows show different sub-periods where growth was fast and then slow and then fast for a little bit and then slow. You also see not only the average growth contribution high from this, this um, residual that we'd like to explain, but the fluctuations are dominated by this residual. So both the average level and the ups and downs are coming from something other than physical and human capital. So that's why I'm not going to emphasize human capital as the main, um, the main topic today. But instead, firm innovation, which might be contributing to this, this mysterious aid growth in the residual. Okay, so I already mentioned why not human capital. You could certainly say, though, that the Bureau of Labor Statistics imperfectly netted out human capital. Maybe it contributes a lot more than, than, uh, than they are accounting for. That's a fair objection that I'm just going to sustain. 
Um, okay, so one whole category that you might be surprised, given some of my previous work, is um, that aggregate production function in the A there, that might be hiding distribution of, of um, capital and labor across firms, or human capital and physical capital, how is it allocated to firms? If there's markup dispersion in the economy, then the high markup firms have too little inputs, and the low markup firms have, have too high inputs. And if you reallocate it from the low value of marginal product to the high, you'd raise aggregate TFP. We raise uh, by increasing the efficiency of your utilization of our given resources, that will show up in this residual total factor productivity measure. Okay, so I'd love to be able to say what's happened to allocate efficiency um, for the whole U.S. economy or for other economies, um, but in the U.S. at least I'm kind of limited by the fact that we, we're missing a bunch of the data we need to do it outside of, say, manufacturing, which I'll argue later is, is uh, too small to, to make the focus, um, or CompuStat, which is these publicly available firms. Um, but to the extent that we have data for them, it doesn't, I'm going to argue it doesn't show much trend over, say, the last 30 years. So if we want to understand what's contributing on average to growth in the U.S. over the last three decades, maybe even the speed up and slowdown, maybe changes in allocative efficiency aren't, aren't the driver. So that's what's going to lead me to focus on, on firm-level innovation as the potential key driver of this, this residual. Okay, so here's, here's a plot of what I mean. This is an estimate from another paper I have with Mark Bills and Key and Ron, which is our measure of allocative efficiency, trying to adjust for things like measurement error, which we think are a problem. Um, for U.S. manufacturing, you see it's very flat over the last 30 years. So that's saying not that we couldn't achieve, say, higher output, the allocative efficiency is far less than 100. So the U.S., by this metric, could increase output almost 25% if it more efficiently allocated capital and labor, um, but that it hasn't changed over time in a way that's either contributed to growth or detracted from growth. Okay. Um, of course, I think allocative efficiency differences are pretty important for differences in level of the development, say the U.S. versus India. People have documented its importance, uh, including some of my work tried to argue it's played a non-trivial role in China's growth, that allocation of resources away from inefficient state-owned enterprises toward more efficient private enterprises may have contributed about a third of their growth in recent decades. So I think it's not trivial at all in some other um, context. But here's in the, in our estimate, also from this paper with Mark Bills and Key and Ron, uh, U.S. versus Indian allocative efficiency. So on the vertical axis, it starts bouncing around 1.3, saying the U.S. manufacturing sector is more efficiently allocates its capital and labor than the Indian manufacturing sector does. So that would say it's an important force holding back efficiency of Indian manufacturing relative to the U.S. So the U.S. is already 80% of efficiency. We're saying India is closer to to 60% um, of efficiency. Okay, but you see there's no, no trend in that necessarily either. Um, this disappointed me. I wrote a paper where I was hoping to find that, because that, uh, India's grown pretty rapidly over the last three decades, I was hoping to find that improving allocative efficiency had played a, a major role. Not that we could, could find. Okay, so now I'm gonna focus on firm-led in, let, firm innovation. So to, to describe what I'm gonna do, I, I'm also gonna describe what I'm not gonna do. Um, and one is going to be, you know, why not focus on patents and R&D? Patents being an output of firm innovation and R&D being an input. Or maybe some sort of decomposition, just like I did that aggregate, just like the standard growth accounting, why not an aggregate, uh, decomposition of aggregate TFP growth into the contribution of different types of firms? You're going to see instead I'm going to go a more indirect approach. So to motivate that, though, I'm going to tell you why not, um, why not <coughs> patents or R&D. Okay, so... Um, an example I like to give is that DuPont, which is like a chemical manufacturer, has 40,000 patents, and uh, Walmart has 40. Um, so by that metric, DuPont is contributing a thousand times, or more than a thousand times, um, uh, 10,000 times, or a thousand times, yeah, more to innovation than, uh, than uh, Walmart is. But Walmart, by other estimates, and I'm, I'm going to use, was much more important for growth. They spread... Um, through every state in the U.S., um, the single biggest private employer in the U.S. I'm going to argue they innovated a lot and, and went into more markets and diffused that innovation. So they were a much bigger contributor. So the problem is basically outside manufacturing firms don't really patent very much. Now you could look at R&D, but again, there's big problems with R&D. The way it's measured in the U.S., it tends to have, have a separate standalone facility. It's often what, what's required. And it's very intensive in manufacturing. So you see 70% in manufacturing. If you just add health and, and software, then you get up to 90%. Um, so those three sectors are maybe 30% of the economy, so bigger than manufacturing, but um, still only 30% of the economy, not necessarily where, 
where the vast majority of the growth is coming from. So in this example, if you think about manufacturing, it's 12% of GDP. You could say, well, maybe it, it's only 12% of GDP, but it's driving most of the growth. Maybe productivity growth is really rapid there. Um, when I calculated it here, I found surprising to me that it was contributing just about as much to aggregate TFP growth uh, as it did to as its share of value added. So at least over this 30, recent 30 year period, they weren't an above average contributor to growth. So that makes me want to look at something broader. Okay, so there's another um, attempt or, 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 or a branch of the literature that says let's just decompose growth in an industry, and maybe we could aggregate industries up at the top into the growth of, of different types of firms. So one popular one is entrants versus exiters. They might look at the TFP of the entering firms and the TFP of the exiting firms, and the bigger that gap and the, and the higher the, the entry rate versus an exit rate, the more that would contribute to growth. And then that, that, and the similar term they might look at is, is a reallocation of capital and labor from low TFP firms to high TFP firms. That might be the reallocation component. And then a third component would be how much do individual firms increase their TFP. Um, so this, just like, I should say, just because I'm not focusing on R&D or patenting today, I don't mean to imply that no one should. Um, those literatures are productive, and we're learning all, all sorts of useful things. I was citing some things that Ufuk and other people have done with patent data. So I'm just saying why it's useful to complement that data with other sources. So I think this is useful as well but I'm about to argue why it might need to be complemented with other data. So I think this literature is uncovered facts. They're just decompositions of the data, so they're inarguable in that sense. There are ways to decompose aggregate growth into different terms. Um, it's atheoretical, which is good. You don't need a model to construct these data measures. That's a good thing. On the other hand, it's bad in the sense that what exactly do you make of these terms depends on you know, your model world and what, what would generate uh, pictures like that. Um, but two pretty key practical limitations keep me from using it today. One is that you need output and input data. So it turns out that's not really available outside of U.S. manufacturing, like detailed inputs of intermediates, uh, different types of labor, different types of capital. That's basically in the U.S. and uh, I think in other countries, like France, there's detailed data like that for the whole economy. So if I were giving it on the French data, I might have, might have at least shown you some of these statistics. But even if I, we weren't on that problem, Another key barrier is, if you're thinking about innovation, um, you're thinking about firms producing higher quality products. So for example, a fact from, albeit from US manufacturing, a fact from US manufacturing is bigger firms don't have lower prices. Um, that might not be surprising to you, but it's surprising if your point of view was that, they, the, that what made them big is they're efficient in a, in a like returns to scale sense or a process efficiency sense, and they should have lower prices. Unless maybe, then you could say, well, maybe their markups are bigger. Well, how are they selling more? How are they selling? Why they're big because they're selling more. They're doing something to attract consumer. And so um, I think that's consistent with the main reason that they're large is not higher process efficiency, but higher quality or higher range of products. So a recent study by Hoffman, Redding, and Weinstein, which was only consumer durable manufacturers, but still, um, said 0% of why big firms were big was because of low prices or, or, or even low markups. And 30% was having a wider range of products, and 70% was what they think is quality differences, selling more per product. Um, so once you think about the, what makes good firms good or, or fast-growing firms grow fast is they're improving quality and variety, then it's natural to ask, when we measure TFP at the firm level, is that what we're picking up? But it turns out that's not what we're picking up. There's, there's no firm-level deflators, typically. There's industry-level deflators. They do attempt to adjust for, for quality at the, uh, at the industry level, but not at the firm level, and, and, and maybe imperfectly adjust for quality. Often data sets, not often, sometimes data sets have average unit prices. So you might have the average unit price of a car, which is useful, um, except that, remember I was saying that um, uh, um, firms that sell a lot don't actually have high prices. So you might want to use high prices as a measure of quality, um, but this would actually say if they had high prices, their effective output was low. So I think you really need a measure of kind of market test. Are they able to sell a lot as a measure of is their quality adjusted and variety adjusted price low? So that's the route that I'm going to go. So lacking kind of firm level deflators, I'm not going to try to decompose growth in this way, in this accounting way, uh, at the micro level. So I'm going to use market shares. That's my market test. And um, even in the US, um, it's not that readily available to have sales across all um, firms, 
Um, so what we're going to use is employment as a proxy for sales. It's very highly correlated with sales. It's not exactly what I'd want. I'd really prefer to have sales. Um, but we're going to use sales. I'm sorry, employment. Um, and it's well measured, relatively easy to measure. How many people do you have? <laughs> And the key idea is that when it's, you know, it's not perfect because you can imagine, say, a firm improving its product and slashing its workforce because, say, it shifted toward you know, robots or something. So it's not a perfect measure, but uh, we're going to use it in a proxy, and you can picture what we're saying is, you know, many mills increase their employment share, and the integrated mills that shrunk. And that's a byproduct of the many mills were introducing this low-cost technology, and they expanded. They're producing different products, and it's hard to measure their, their efficiency in the regular TFP way. We don't even have firm deflators. But we can see that the, the mini mills were rising and the um, integrated mills were shrinking. So we can see this for entrance. How important are entrance? Rather than look at the TFP of the entrance versus the exiters, suppose it was the same. Suppose the TFP of the entrant and the exiters were the same as we would measure it. If the entrant was bigger in terms of the market share than the, the exiter, they're grabbing a bigger market share, they're arguably doing something better than the exiters did. And that's the kind of information we're gonna use. What's the market share captured by entrance? That should be a function of what's the quality and variety uh, of stuff that they're introducing. Okay, similarly, if, if survivors innovate, so Apple, I'll show you a plot. Um, Apple expanded after introducing the, the iPhone. Um, and then creative destruction should have a particular marker, which is the same time you see entrance, you should see a bunch of exiters. See a bunch of firms shrinking rapidly at the same time. Somebody comes in and, and grabs a bunch of the market. In contrast, if you think about successive generations of iPhones, an example of what I'm calling own innovation by firms, um, the market share changes are, are relatively modest. And that's going to be a key point because it could be that, say, the same exact same innovation, a 10% improvement over the previous smartphone, if it's produced by the same previous producer, the market share might not change very much. But if it's produced by a brand new producer, then the incumbent shrinks and the entrant uh, takes over. So you can see a lot different job flows and employment flows from the same innovation depending on whether it's creative destruction or own innovation. That's going to be a key point that I want to um, convey today. Okay, so Apple. Here's my Apple picture. So this is employment at Apple. And you might be like me thinking, employment at Apple? Apple, you know, Foxconn produces uh, stuff and all the parts are in places, produced in places like uh, Taiwan and in the Philippines. So this is actually retail employment at the Apple stores, it's dominated by retail employment. So this is Apple's employment in the US. And you see it takes off after they introduce the iPhone and later after they introduce the, the iPod. Those are the, the, the biggest jumps. And if you look at Blackberry and Nokia, they shrank over this latter period when Apple was taking off in terms of their smartphone sales. Smartphones are now one third, or two thirds, sorry, of Apple's revenue. Um, if you look at TFP at Apple, it's flat. Revenue per, per unit of capital and labor, it's actually flat. But they've tripled in size relative to if they didn't have any, any uh, iPhone sales. So that's a perfect example about why I'm not going to use this TFP level of decomposition at the firm level. I'm viewing the fact that Apple expanded as a byproduct. They introduced something that, that was high quality um, um, that consumers liked. Okay, so, um, all right. So I want the advantage of, of employment is it's available for the is a much broader share of the U.S. economy. So rather than focus on manufacturing, which is 10%, um, we're going to be able to use census data from the longitudinal business database that covers basically the whole non-farm private business sector. So everybody who has a paid employee is supposed to be in this. Um, so there are millions of self-employed, but they don't, they, they're like less than 1% of, of uh, output. So the main things that's missed from this, it covers greater than 80% of employment, um, the main thing is missed is the farm sector and the government um, sectors. So it's basically everybody, every private that you'd want except for the farm sector. And in several uh, decades, and we can look at some periods within that. Okay, so one thing that jumps out, I mean, this is emphasized by Steve Davis, John Haltwanger, Scott Chu, which is massive amounts of job reallocation. So um, at the same time, so how's this calculated? And the horizontal axis is growth rate of employment, and a two is, is an entry. I actually took off the literal entry, so it goes up to almost two. If you had that two, you'd see one spike at the, at the right and one spike at the left. So exit is minus two. So it's, it's employment at T minus employment at T minus one divided by the average. So that way you don't have infinity for, for entrance and so on. So entrance plus two, exit is minus two. And there's some missing spikes at the end, but even excluding those literal entry and exit, um, you see lots of simultaneous creation and destruction here. 
Um, and 80% of this is within industry. If you're thinking, oh, maybe it's the healthcare sector rising and the manufacturing sector shrinking, that's not it. It's mostly within narrow industries, even like six digit days. So even within very narrow industries, that's where this action is happening. You see some retailers expanding and some retailers contracting. Some um, you know, uh, uh, manufacturers expanding and some contracting. So you've probably seen statistics like that of, of like 4% turnover per month. So like in the US, that's like 6 million jobs uh, uh, gained and lost in a given month. Um, okay, so it's simultaneously happening. And we're saying that's natural to look at this and say this is going to be some systematic evidence consistent with creative destruction playing some role. Why would firms have to shrink so much if all that happened was, you know, they, they, they didn't improve their own product as much as they usually do. They usually improve it, you know, 2% on average, they improved it only 1% or failed to improve it. That shouldn't make them be crushed and, 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 and uh, cut in half in terms of their employment. And same thing with these firms, um, you know, entering or growing rapidly. We're going to say that's consistent with firms. Uh, adding whole new products that drove out some of the, so the left tail and the right tail simultaneously are consistent with creative destruction. So you can picture what, what we're going to do is we're going to use data, we're going to have to try to simulate a model with creative destruction, new varieties, own innovation, to try to get it to mimic this picture. And in doing so, we're going to have to have an important role for creative destruction. Okay, another key thing that I think is consistent with creative destruction is if you look at the, this happens to be for manufacturing. But the picture is similar, but I just didn't have the granularity handy for outside manufacturing. But on the vertical axis is the exit rate, and the horizontal axis is employment. If you thought that firms exited just because there's some overhead costs that, are, that we all have, and they couldn't cover it, they weren't efficient enough to cover it, that, doesn't, that looks a little bit like the data. It's downward sloping. Um, but that, those theories would basically explain uh, almost all the exit would be at the small level, and none of the exit would be at the high level. So, so you wouldn't see big firms or big plants exit. You see a ton of it. In fact, if you look at the job destruction associated with exit, it's, it's the majority of it's actually at above average employment plants. So you don't necessarily want to think exit is a phenomenon of small uh, firms. You want to think about it as majority of it's actually above average size firms. So what would, it's not just that they, they're small and they just happen to be not able to cover some, some minor overhead costs. It looks like something forced them out. They are usually big. And now they've, they've exited altogether, like my block, blockbuster example. So I, I view this, the fact that the majority of, of exit, of job destruction associated with exit is that above average size firms is consistent with um, somebody's forcing them out, some economic activity. And many theories for tractability of firm dynamics will just say, we'll put it in an exogenous exit rate. So this is saying, no, that, that exit happened for a socially uh, productive reason, which is somebody came up with something better. But it's vital when thinking about growth or macro, macro economy, the performance of macro economy is to not think of exit as just happening randomly for no reason, but to think of it happening endogenously because of somebody who came in better. So I, you can see I'm really uh, embracing creative destruction as a fundamental force behind this large declines in employment of some firms and out and out exit. And I should have clarified, um, we're going to have in mind firms that have a portfolio of products. Remember I was saying 30% you know, of why non-durable manufacturers are big is because they have a wide variety of products. So we're going to allow firms to have multiple products. So you can shrink a lot. Say you had, like, if, if, if the iPhone stops selling so much, Apple will probably shrink but not die. They might be cut more than in half. But that's creative destruction if somebody else comes up with a better, cheaper um, iPhone. But it won't necessarily lead the firm to out and out exit. Right? You might have lots of products, losing your products from your portfolio. So we're going to try to take that into account, too. We're going to have firms with portfolio of products. When they add products, they'll move far to the right. When they lose products, they'll move far to the left. OK, so that also contributes to this. So one of the reasons we're going to say um, big firms have lower exit rates is because they have a bigger portfolio of products. They may lose some of their products, but not all of them. Blockbuster had one product line, and they lost that, that, that product line. OK. So a little bit of math saying, you know, we're going to write down a model where there's quality, that's the cube, there's um, quantity that's produced, um, and then this is basically a model where the production and labor of the firm, of, of, from a variety, I should say, J, so we're going to have this capital M, that's the total number of varieties, that can grow. So we're going to have basically three sources of growth, like I was describing. M growing is like variety growth. But the Q's growing can come from two sources. They can come from creative destruction, a firm that wasn't producing Variety J and now is introducing a, a product that takes over that product. That's creative destruction. Or an incumbent that's already producing that. 
that gen produces, it's like Intel coming up with another generation of its micro, particular microprocessor. That would be an increase in, another type of increase in Q, but coming from an incumbent rather than um, creative destruction. So what this simple setup gives you, and you can obviously generalize it in many ways, but it's many times I, I view models as like maps. Like um, maps, you want them as simple as, you want them as uncluttered as possible as long as it has the information you need. So this is the simplest map for thinking about how employment might be, by, might be correlated with sales, which it is in the data, um, and un underlying related to the quality. This is employment at a product level, for employment associated with producing a product J, uh, is going to be associated with how, how high the quality is. The higher the quality of the product, the bigger the market share it will garner. Um, and there's a lot of literature thinking about how to estimate what's that elasticity, and, and I've contributed some and other people have contributed some. So that's going to be a critical thing is, you know, if you see a firm grow, how much did it increase its quality to attain that growth? So I won't even show you those estimates, but there's a whole, a whole literature trying to do that, as I said, including some of my work. Okay, so then a firm here, F is denoting a firm. A firm is a collection of products that the firm controls. And the higher the quantity of products it controls and the higher the quality, the higher its market share. So if we're thinking a firm as this portfolio of products, it could grow because it added products or because its existing products got better in quality. So it either did carried out brand new varieties or creative destruction of another firm's varieties or it improved its own quality of its own varieties. All three of those things could contribute to an existing firm expanding. Um, an entry, though, has to be a firm that didn't have any varieties and either creatively destroys an existing variety or generates a brand new variety that it introduces. And from the macro point of view, getting back to Sir Richard Stone, the labor productivity in this economy has increases in the total number of varieties. There's a love of variety here. Consumers want to have varieties to choose from. This is a very arid model with a single type of consumer, but as is well known in I.O., you can micro-found this by having heterogeneous consumers with ideal varieties. So we don't have every car model individually, but we might have one that we that fits our that characteristics fit our preferences most closely. Um, this can be a reduced form for exactly that kind of structure. Um, so there, there's still a love of variety. The more choices you have to choose from, the more likely you'll be able to get something closest to your ideal characteristics. Okay, so there's this love of variety component, and then there's this average quality component. And I haven't built in the process efficiency for the reason I gave. I'm really focusing on the quality dimension. Okay, so growth comes from variety growth and from quality growth in this world. So consistent with my motivation, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to estimate my version of the accounting of the, for TFP growth is I want to know the arrival rate of you know, how frequently do incumbents improve their product, how frequently is there creative destruction from entrance, delta for, for destroy, um, I for incumbents, E for entrance. Uh, how, much do creative, how much do incumbents creatively destroy each other? Um, so I guess Apple is an example of creative destruction in the iPhone market, in the uh, smartphone market, that was done by an incumbent. So that would be an example of Delta I, whereas Netflix was a new entrant that was creatively destroying an existing firm. So that would be Delta sub E. But then there's brand new varieties that people come up, up with altogether, so the first smartphone, if you will. Um, and they, they can come from incumbents, the I, or, or uh, uh, entrance. And then the, these are the arrival rates, so I'm interested in those, but I'm also interested in how good they are. Um, so again, imagine we're going to use information about market shares and, and the frequency with which firms are rising and, small, and falling. We're going to use firm dynamics information to try to infer all of these things as well as how good those things are. We're trying to back out of the, of the employment growth distribution, if you will, and various aspects of it, including those exit things I showed you, um, try to figure out what these are, try to infer what they are. Okay, so then to just drive this home, picture a firm has three varieties. I'm, this, I'm reiterating, but it's just to make sure uh, we're on the same page. So picture a firm has like three varieties. It can innovate by improving on, taking steps on its own varieties. And again, you can all come up with examples of this, of like successive generations of uh, car models, smartphones, microprocessors produced by the same company. But then you can also have them, you know, like Apple adding the, the um, smartphones to its list, to its portfolio, and that would be another source of innovation. And you could also have um, somebody introducing a brand new variety um, to their portfolio. And you could also have entering firms that either come in and do some creative destruction or, or come in and, and with brand new varieties. So again, just recapping, these are all the kind of things we're going to try to estimate, or that I and my collaborators have tried to estimate using the LBD data. OK, so and you can take aggregate growth here, decompose it into how much comes from new varieties. Well, that's 
you know, how, how, how does it arrive and how good is it? How much comes from own innovation, which is how fast does it arrive and how good is it? And how much comes from creative destruction, which is how fast does it arrive and how, how good is it? But you can also decompose it into what was done by entrance, either new varieties or creative destruction, and what's done by incumbents, either new, new varieties or creative destruction or own innovation. So you can break, you can, once you have all these component terms, you can group them in various ways. And you can even do stuff that I'm, I'm not showing you here, which I will show you some estimates of, things like how much comes from fast growing firms. The, you know, the, the gazelles or the fast growers, are they the majority of growth or not? Okay. Um, so here's what you get just to kind of build intuition of how we do this indirect inference, basically. Um, if, you, if we simulate a model of, um, with only creative destruction, and we ask what's the distribution of employment growth? So again, employment growth would be calculated as if a, if a firm expands, say it goes from 100 employees to 150, that's a, a, um, an observation, I think 1.25 here. Um, and if they, they are 1.5 maybe, but uh, um, and if they go from 100 to 50, that's gonna be like a, uh, in this range. So we can calculate firms with these portfolios going from zero to, to one, that would be an entry, from one to zero, that would be an exit, um, or from two to three products, and then they would be in this range, or from three to two products, they'd be in this range. What you see here is that you got thick tails. So creative destruction is really good at creating firms that expand a lot and firms that contract a lot. Now, it didn't have to be that way. If firms had thousands of products, then adding a few and adding uh, uh, losing a few, the distribution would be in here. But we do observe a lot here. Um, we do observe exit by, by big firms. If big firms had a thousand independent products, you wouldn't see them exit very often. So the fact that even many large-sized firms have non-trivial exit rates make us say firms don't have a huge portfolio. The typical firm doesn't have a huge portfolio of products. Think of Apple, where they've got basically three product lines that are all pretty important to it. Um, so um, that means, though, if firms don't have huge portfolios, creative destruction alone would make for very thick tails. And there are some, 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 some data at the extremes, but we're going to clear we're going to want something in the middle, too. So that's where own innovation in particular will come in. Um, picture own innovation, the way we're going to do it is not that every firm improves by the same amount, but that they're, they're all stochastically innovating on their existing products. And so if they innovate a lot, they'll grow a lot. If they innovate a little, they'll grow a little. If they don't innovate at all, they'll shrink. Um, in fact, if they innovate, you might say, what are these different ones? Well, if they, don't in, if they innovate a little bit, they'll only shrink a little. If they don't keep up with the average, then they'll shrink a little. It's only when they, they really don't do anything at all that they'll shrink a fair bit. So this is illustrating, we can get lots of mass. We can get the mass in the tails through creative destruction. We can get a lot of mass in the middle through uh, own innovation. So it gives you the flavor of what we're going to be doing. We're going to be simulating a model and saying, which of these ingredients? It's almost like you showed me the, the picture of the cake that came out, and I'm going to try to infer the ingredients that, that went into it. Um, that's, that's the reverse engineering exercise we're, we're, we're doing here. OK, so now I'm, now I'm going to start showing you numbers that we get out of it. Rather than show you how exactly we do the reverse engineering, I'm, I'm just trying to, trying to give you intuition. Now I'm going to show you what we find. Um, OK, so um, that's this question, what types of firm innovation? Um, OK, so here's our estimate. This is, let me say, the data, first of all. This is 83 to 2013, so 30-year period. And um, so we have uh, 176 basis points, so 1.76% average annual growth in um, TFP over this period in the US. And we're estimating that um, over half of it comes from own innovation. Okay. And, and again, I, you, know, you can quote patent data, you can quote um, uh, R&D data. Those would be a much higher fraction than this. And we're saying those fractions are too high because, first of all, the concentrated manufacturing, and this is the whole the private sector, but also because small firms are much less likely to report patenting and, and, and do R&D, and firms outside manufacturing are just less likely to. So, so we're estimating the majority does come from there. Um, we're, but we're saying creative destruction is important, right? We're saying that's like a fourth of growth. If you think of new varieties, too, put those together, that's a non-trivial amount. That's you know, 62 basis points per year on average. Um, so all of them, I mean, I guess Paul Romer's Nobel Prize winning you know, paper, he's a whole body of work, but the paper that was most influential, you could say we're estimating that small. Um, but uh, I think the spirit of what Paul was about was innovation that's not, that creates non-rival products, creates scale effects, and, and, and require that you have imperfect competition. I'm using that. I don't think, I've heard him say, it doesn't matter whether it's quality ladders 
uh, or a variety. So, he, so the key ideas that he um, was citing for, this doesn't really hinge on the variety channel. But if you did say, you know, this is kind of like, ag these are the Avion and Howitt uh, quality ladders, we're saying that's 90% of the story, and maybe 10% for the Romarian type channel. But, we're, but that's not saying it's all creative destruction. I said quality ladders could be incumbents, you know, these later follower dynamics like Intel versus these followers, or it could be um, creative destruction. We're saying it's not mostly creative destruction by our estimate. It's mostly incumbents improving what they already do. And the, the key intuition is there's, there's so many modest employment changes in the data. Um, and we're referring that those are firms improved modestly what they did, and that's why they expanded a little. And the ones that failed to, they contracted a little. If somebody came up with a close substitute, then you should have exited, you should have uh, contracted by more. Um, okay. So we can also do the, um, the, uh, the time periods. So it, I'm splitting it evenly, but uh, a little bit later, if I have time, I'll show you a breakdown that, um, that, that breaks it into um, uh, closer to the 10-year the speed up the United States have from like 1996 to 2005. But this is just splitting our 30-year sample evenly. So what you find is that, interestingly, first of all, new varieties are shrinking as important. So I didn't even mention this whole literature on declining business dynamism. So declining rates of entry and exit in the U.S. and many other economies that we're all troubled by. You're troubled by it if you feel that new firms are, are generating, um, like, exit to a non-economist. You're like, why are you troubled by declining exit rates? Um, because I, I think that's a byproduct of creative destruction. So if that's falling, that might be bad. That might be that new stuff isn't coming along, improving, uh, contributing to growth, and driving out competitors. So... This is the kind of thing that's contributing to that. And even the creative destruction rate, it blips up and then comes down. So if you do here versus here, here versus there, we are saying there's a role for declining business dynamism contributing to the slower growth rate. You've seen in the US that here, if you add this together, it's 98 basis points per year. Actually, here it looks like a speed up and then a slow down. If I broke it in a finer way, you'd see more of a, uh, a speed up and then a, a big sharp slowdown. So I'll show you some of that a little bit later. You see the non-trivial role for these, that's, that's um, 20 basis points up, um, and then this, but this is uh, 48 basis points up. So the biggest role of the increase and the decrease comes from the own innovators. So as worried as we should be about the um, declining business dynamism, we might be equally or more worried about incumbents might not be continuing to innovate as much as they, they do. So, sorry. One, one example, though, of a limit of this accounting is that it's distinctly possible that the reason um, own innovators are, are innovating um, less, meaning here versus here, um, is precisely because they have less threat from creative destruction or from entrants competing with them. So in a model where you endogenize these, you can build in these strategic complementarities, and it could be that whatever is thwarting entry and creative destruction is also discouraging. It could encourage them. They could be strategic substitutes. It could be like, if I don't have to worry about somebody taking over my market, I'm going to be more comfortable continuing to innovate on my product line. On the other hand, you can have these escape from competition effects, whereas I've got to keep innovating or else I'm going to be creatively destroyed. Um, so that's a really important caveat, I think. This is kind of finding proximate contributions. It's kind of like growth accounting you know, into output, into physical capital and human capital and residual TFP. It doesn't tell us all we want to know. It's just a really important ingredient. You know, it's a stepping stone to then say, okay, where did the physical capital come from? Where did the human capital come from? That's what we're doing here. We're, we're saying, Here's our estimate of how residual TFP, how much of it's coming from these other sources. Now that we know that, we kind of want to understand the details of that, understand more of the economics about why they're doing what they're doing, like what role do markups play and markup dispersion play in this. Um, I'll give you a talk tomorrow where I'll talk about how these things would be related to each other. Okay, um, so now I'm ready to, to talk about uh, which firms. So, um, Entrance versus incumbents, fast growing uh, incumbents versus slow growing incumbents. So here, I want to emphasize, you know, it, it, people often point out entrants are responsible for half of job creation. And sometimes you'd say they're responsible for all, more than all of net job creation. Now, of course, if this number is a lot smaller than this, that means they're also responsible for the, or the small firms, or, or exiters are responsible for the majority of, of exit um, as well. But, uh, anyway, so the net, you can have an economy with, with constant employment in the aggregate, and you know, anybody expanding is responsible for an infinite amount of job creation because there, there isn't any on net. So if you look at this, it looks like they're incredibly important. Here it looks like they're very important. Percentage of all new jobs coming from, I should stress here, here we're defining entrance as five years old or less. 
Okay, so we're, we're not saying they're literally their first year. We wouldn't want to use literally the first year, partly for partial year, op year issues that, you know, they might start mid-year, and so the first year of operation doesn't really do justice to how big they are. But another reason we define them as five years old is that the growth rate of firms is really high for the first five years, and then it tends to, to, to dramatically slow down. So it's relatively flat post five years and really steep and coming down the first five. So you can either think of that as adjustment costs in terms of their capital and labor, or maybe adjustment costs in acquiring customers. Maybe they're building up their, their customer base for those first five years. Um, so that's why we wanted to consider all firms five years and under as, as entries. Um, okay, and then if you look at fast growing incumbents, call those the gazelles or, or rockets, so growing 20% per year for a five year period, um, they're not as responsible for as much, but still, 13% uh, of job creation and a lot of net job creation. You put them together, they're 63% of gross, gross job creation. But when we look at their TFP growth, we get something much smaller. So we get the entrants are responsible for 50% of job creation, but only 13% of TFP growth. And these fast growers, responsible for only 4% of TFP growth. So that says that fascination with gazelles or rockets might be misplaced. There's just not enough movement, they're not big enough to contribute to most of growth. They're growing rapidly, but they're just not the, the biggest part of the story. Um, so one of the keys to that, though, is what I was mentioning earlier, so I want to drive it home again, which is, you know, you can generate a lot of job creation by improving something in the, that's currently in the market by only 10%, whereas an incumbent who does it might only grow a little bit. So the same amount of job, uh, same amount of innovation might be associated with a ton of job creation or not. Here's incumbents, here's the slow growers, here's the pokey firms, they're only 37% of job creation, but they're 65% of growth. So that's like these successive generations of products. You don't see the market share change that much when somebody comes up with a new car model or a new, new iPhone, but that might be carrying a bunch of growth. And surprisingly, firms that are shrinking are actually contributing more to growth in our estimate than the entrants in the gazelles and the rockets combined. How is that? Well, if you don't innovate enough, you still fall behind, right? Because the whole economy is advancing. This says firms that are shrinking are actually innovating. Um, so this kind of shows you these firms are important, but it's not, not that important in the whole grand scheme of things. Shrink, so we shouldn't be so obsessed, according to our estimate, you shouldn't be so obsessed with the, uh, um, the unicorns and, and think about Because there's so much attention to these firms got really big, we just want more of those. There's just not that many of them. They're not growing that much to explain most of growth. Okay. We can break it down by age. I, I don't want to emphasize the first year too much for the reason I said. There's partial year effects. Um, so this is one where we break it into sub-periods. And we're seeing firms that, that are over 50 years old, they're half of growth, or 15 years old, not 50. Um, so 36% of job creation, uh, but, but half of growth. So again, a, a caveat's important here as well, which is to say, um, you know, maybe it's important, Apple was an incumbent when it introduced the, the iPhone, but Apple was not a thousand years old, right? So it might be important that Apple was founded in the, in the 1970s and not in the 1870s or the, you know, year zero. There might be something about newish firms. It might not literally be zero to five, but there's something in a firm's DNA that makes it hard to innovate after it gets too old. There's something inflexible or, or something about firm operation. So in that way, I, I, again, it shows the limit of this proximate stuff. If you shut down entry, you might shut down growth. Um, and so this wouldn't reveal that. This picture here doesn't really reveal that. Um, so it's, again, a proximate estimate. It's saying the firms that are contributing to growth might be you know, 20 years old. They might be like Apple, 30 years old, introducing the iPhone, or Intel introducing yet another generation and satisfying Moore's law of a microprocessor. Um, but if, if uh, all entries stopped, maybe you wouldn't have these 50-year-old, 30-year-old firms innovating like crazy. Um, so I certainly wouldn't jump from here to saying you could, you could cut off entry, you could get rid of all the young firms and everything would be fine, or you know, most of growth would keep going. I wouldn't say that at all. But it does say we, should, we shouldn't necessarily say uh, we need to cultivate more of the young. That's not obvious at all. Or more of the um, fast growers, that's not obvious at all to me from this. We're getting a lot, most of our growth from other sources. Okay, um, now the last category, which I don't think have, they have time for, is to ask, do these things show up in official statistics? Are we measuring them in observed growth that we measure in the data? Um, so I argue creative destruction. So some people argue it's the source of growth, and some, Aggie, Aggie and Howard are pretty diversified. They have step-by-step -step innovation models, which are like own innovation, and they have creative destruction models, 
Um, so they, they're, they're, they're the two thirds of the, the, the three possibilities, and the one other third would be the Romarian force. Um, but we estimated it was non trivial, 26% of growth. Um, so our key question here is. Is it obvious that this is easy to measure? I mentioned it was really hard at the firm level to, to measure um, quality of variety. Well, do we measure it at all in our price index for the industry or for the economy? Um, so another whole side of me is, is price measurement and price uh, micro data on prices. And so as soon as I started getting interested in, in productivity at the firm level or the product level, it was natural to think about, well, how do we measure that? And the price becomes critical for that. Um, the same way that you go from national accounting in nominal terms to in real terms, you need these, to, these price indices and deflators. You need some measure um, of this uh, at the product level. So it turns out that it's very common when, uh, especially the thing about creative destruction involves a whole new producer. So I went around with a CPI price collector in the U.S. for a day, and I was really interested in how they deal with product turnover. Um, what happens when a product disappears? And the first thing they try to do is kind of ask if it's on, just temporarily stock out. Um, if it's not, or, or, or uh, um, if it's gonna, on order, then it's gonna come back. If they say, no, we're not gonna order it again, the next thing they do is they look in that outlet. They look in that very same outlet for something that's close. So it'd be like, Sony produced a uh, keyboard and they're looking for something that has this vector of say a dozen attributes that they have on this list. Does it have a lot of those attributes? Does it look like the next version of the same thing we used to track before? And if they can find it, they say, okay, this is a product substitution. I'll record the price. I'll send this a packet, this information back to a commodity specialist in DC to, just, to make a quality comparison. And ideally, they would use some hedonic measures uh, that relate price to attributes and say that the, this new version of the Sony keyboard differs in these attributes, and we think this contributes together to 3% higher quality. So the price went up 5%, we'll say 3% of it's higher quality, and 2% of it is quality adjusted inflation. Okay, now think about what happens when it's a new producer. There's all these keyboards there, right? And some of them are in different outlets. Some of them are, you know, on Amazon and Circuit City's gone. There's no mechanism in the price collection, in the CPI, or the, definitely not the PPI, the producer price index, to go and track down the products and their prices of the, of the entered the market and drove out the exiting products. So the whole structure is just really expensive to do that. I mean, think about in the PPI, they're tracking individual firms. The firm says, we no longer ship that product. What it would take to go out, they'd have to survey the buyers of that product and say, where are you now getting something similar to what you used to do before? That would be doubling their, their resource costs for that survey because they'd have to have all these buyers on top of all these sellers. So they don't do that, partly because it's expensive. Um, so they're really, what they're really good at is tracking the price of the same thing over time. And they are aware they have a quality problem, and they put a lot of effort into making quality adjustments when it's the same manufacturer, when it's the same brand, because that's when they can in the same outlet, because that's when they can tie. That's, so this is kind of like a version of outlet bias, um, but it's not just outlet bias, because if it's, say, Walmart driving out a mom and pop store, and by the way, there's a Clano grocery store in upstate Michigan. Um, <laughs> my great grandfather started, it is much smaller, it wasn't completely exited, but it's in the left side of that distribution. Um, because Walmart came to town, and um, now they sell stuff like alcohol and, and meat that Walmart doesn't specialize in. Um, so they shrunk a lot. Um, but they're not, they're not equipped, so it's not just the same product. It's not just the same things that were in the Clinton grocery store that were in the, Wal then the Walmart that opened up. Walmart has all of these products. So that's like a big version of, of, a, of an outlet bias that's part of creative destruction. They may have come up with better stuff, but also a greater variety of stuff. And their, their price collection mechanism is just not designed to capture that at all. So when I was decomposing growth, I was assuming the growth measurement was perfect. It was capturing everything that the model said was occurring. And here I'm saying, it's not geared to do this at all. So now you might say, what do they do? Well, when they can't find a really close substitute at the same outlet, they say, this month we'll drop that observation. Meaning we won't make a price comparison, a price relative, they call it, between this item, this, this month and last month, because we have a missing observation. So implicitly, they're putting all the weight on all the other products that they did have data for. That sounds kind of reasonable. You, you know, you don't have any data, so let's throw it out. Um, but it's not a random occurrence. It's not just you randomly fail to observe this product. It's endogenous to creative destruction. Precisely the products that got eclipsed by creative destruction have vanished from your sample. So this is a sample selection problem. Okay, so this is our our example to kind of convey this intuition 
it's stylized, but it actually comes up surprisingly close to some aspects of the data. So, in particular, so imagine there's there's uh, um, eighty percent of items that have no quality improvement at all. I'm not going to have any variety of growth at all, just quality improvement in this this simple story. Um, they have four percent inflation, and the price of them increased four percent for those eighty percent of prices, eighty percent of items, and then ten percent of items. You have innovation without creative destruction. So the quality, say, goes up um, 10%, and so the quality, the, the price might still go up 4%, but the quality adjusted price basically went down 6%. So the true inflation rate for them was minus 6%. But let's say for another 10% of items, so the realistic part is 20% of items um, turn over in a year. So the exit rate of products in the CPI and the PPI is about 20% per year. So that's the sense in which these numbers weren't, weren't made up. And uh, if anything, this is a little generous. That, that about half of them, or less, are products where they come up with a substitute and make a quality adjustment. Um, they say that we, we can implement some comparison because it's the same manufacturer and we have some way to do that. And majority of them, however, they, they basically drop it from the sample. Say we, we don't see it. So in this example, stylized example, there's 2% true inflation because it's a weighted average, 80 on this, 10 on this, 10 on this. You weight these together, you get 2% inflation. The real growth is 2%, because 10% of the products, all well, 20% of the products improved um, by 10%, so you get 2% real growth. But if you drop from the sample these observations and reallocated the weight on these collectively, you actually get 2.9% inflation, which means you'll, you'll get measured growth of 1.1% rather than 2. So you'll miss 0.9% of the 2% growth. Okay? Now, this was an example where I had half the growth coming from creative destruction, so maybe that was too generous. That, that's the sense in which it's not realistic. I just gave you estimates where 26% of growth came from creative destruction. But it's nice and stylized and rounded, but it illustrates the problem. So what, what is built into this uh, problem? Um, I was going to show you one, so right here. So what's built into this problem, here's a little math for it, but what's built into this problem is, I said it words that this wasn't random. Um, and when you impute to all the other things, I'll probably go back, you're putting a bunch of weight on products that didn't improve at all. When ideally, in this stylized example, you'd want to put all the weight on these innovators. But that's assuming something, too. That's assuming that the step size, the 10% improvement, was the same for the stuff you measured it as the stuff you, you dropped from the sample. So I don't know that that's true. So, so the problem is, I break it into here, and what's the problem created by creative destruction in, in dropping those items from the sample? Well, not all the incumbent products that you did track, the other 90%, not all of them involved innovation. So that's going to generate some bias. And then there's bias that could go either way of, is the quality improvement higher or lower for the average creative destructive droid product versus the average incumbent product? I can make arguments either way on that one. You could say creative destruction has to be really high step size, has to be a really big improvement, otherwise they can't grab the market from the, the, the established incumbent. But you could also say the incumbent's got to, you know, replacing themselves. So unless it's a big enough improvement, they won't bother. Whereas the, the creative destroyer, all they need to do is have something better, and they potentially can get a big chunk of the market. Okay, so um, so we take that idea and we try to implement it and try to ask, you know, how much is U.S. growth over the same 30-year period I described? How much of it is is uh, understated because of creative destruction? And in particular, uh, the growth rate fell in that U.S. most recent 10-year period. How much of that slowdown is due to um, missed growth. So has, has missed growth gotten bigger? So I mentioned that it was 26% of all growth, but maybe it's gotten to be a bigger fraction. And so maybe some of the slowdown in growth is illusory. People are looking around themselves saying, I, I see lots of innovation. Maybe it's not a lot of new firms, but it seems like there's stuff happening out there, especially in, in um, information and in communication technology. Maybe growth is happening. We just don't see it. Okay. So we estimate 0.5 percentage points per year, which is about 50 basis points in the terms. That, so not trivial. And we do see an increase in the most recent period, but it's not, it's not enough to explain the, the slowdown. So I'll show you, show you our arguments on that. Um, so, but first let me say the idea. We're going to use the market share approach again. We use the same thing, which is to say, um, how good is the stuff we're missing? We're going to say, what's the market share of these new? We do it in terms of plants. But if we have goods, this is very much related to Feenstra's. Uh, approach and we applied it first international trade. Uh, Broad and Weinstein have famous applications of it. The Hotman, Redding, and Weinstein papers I described it's very much in the same spirit. They're looking at all these market shares, and they, if they see somebody with a high market share, especially adjusted for the price they observe, and uh, for a given product, they say it must be good. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to say if we see a high market share, 
for a new plant. Well, I'll get to that in a second. If we could see the products, if we could do like they do for grocery stores and drug stores where they have uh, universal product codes, if we could literally see the products, we would just do this at the product level. That would be ideal. Um, so, so we're basically going to say if the new products that we can measure, we'll see in a second, if they have a bigger share of the market than the products that exited, then, then the creative destruction contributes more growth. That's the key thing. So they have to, the incumbents that survive have to shrink. And one way to see that is the imputation that assumed that the inflation rate was the same for products that were disappearing as for the incumbents that you could measure. That's like saying the market share should be stable, right? Because the inflation rate's the same, the relative prices did nothing, so the inflation rate for the stuff that disappeared should be the same as inflation. So we're using the fact that if the market share is bigger, if they eat into the market share on that, the entrants are bigger than the exiters, they must, they are forcing the incumbents to shrink, they must be doing something better. Okay, so we implement it with establishment data. We're, it's like counting, it's saying creative destruction has to come through new establishment. It might come from existing firms, but it's a new establishment of an existing firm. That, that's, you know, an empirical proxy. It's certainly not perfect. You can tell examples that I think fit nicely, like new car models almost always go in new plants. Um, on, on, the other hand, new, uh, on the other hand, you can tell stories where like new generations of, of microprocessors tend to come up with new plants as well, even though it's within the same firm. So we can do warring anecdotes on that one too. So I'm not saying it's perfect, but this is kind of illustrating our attempt. I think it works pretty well in things like retail because like Walmart's expansion uh, it's almost entirely on entering new markets and geographically that show up as new establishments. So creative destruction in the retail industry arguably goes through through establishments. Okay, so if you do this, that's where you get 54 basis points per year. Um, and it's about 50 through all three periods. It does accelerate in the last period. So it accelerates by 17 basis points, but not a big amount. So this is a slightly different division that added a couple years here and subtracted a couple years here to kind of maximize, you'll see what I'm doing. If we add these up together, this looks like a bigger deceleration here. If I, if I put two more years here and take out two years from the, the end. Um, this middle period, you know, the growth rate in the US went from 180 basis points per year, 1.8 percentage point per year, 2.7, and then fell to, to 98. So of 170 basis point decline, we're saying 17 um, might be explained by growing this measure. So not trivial but a tenth of the story. So we're like chipping away here. Um, so I have another paper with some collaborators at Stanford um, and Visa Incorporated that looks at the value of e-commerce. And e-commerce doesn't fit very well into this new establishment framework. We estimate something like 1% accumulated missed growth over, but over like 20 years. So maybe we get another five basis points from that. So you can see we're chipping away um, and, and, it, and it's accelerating. So one of the one of the counter arguments to the missing growth hypothesis is that we've always had missing growth. So when people are saying, oh, look at all these new products and services we don't capture, people said, well, you know, we had lots of new products and services 30 years ago or 40 years ago or 20 years ago too. It has to become a bigger problem. We're saying it is somewhat surprising when become a bigger problem. I say surprisingly because entry rates are down. So how come new establishments are contributing a bigger amount than they did before? And the answer is, the, the entry rates particularly fall in for the gross entry rate, not the, the net entry rate has fallen less, and then at the firm level much more dramatically than at the establishment level. So in other words, big existing firms are opening up, like Walmart, are opening up big establishments um, that are taking over market share. So that's where we're getting this. It's consistent with the theme that incumbents are doing an important part of, of, of growth. Um, we're getting in a bunch of missed growth, and it's predominantly coming from new establishments of existing firms. Um, you see these hospitals going into new markets, opening up new outlets that incorporate more technology, different medical practices. So which is speaking of which, okay, where is this happening? Um, actually, hotels and restaurants. So this is both good and bad. I'm being transparent. So um, it's like saying the new hotels are driving out and grabbing more market shares and the closing hotels, same thing with the restaurants. A little bit worried about fashion you know, cycles there. People just want variety over time. That's why new restaurants tend to do better. Um, you see it in retail trade more generally. Um, you see some in professional services. Um, hospitals are in here somewhere too. Uh, the missed categories are about 25%. But notice manufacturing is not, not a big part of the story. But the caution on there is what we're missing here is imports. So we may be losing a bunch of domestic varieties of um, products, but we're gaining imported varieties. So this misses that altogether. Okay, um, 
All right, so one question you could ask, I'm, I'm running out of time, but I want to say a few more things. One thing is, um, you know, why do you care if growth is missed? What does it matter? This gets back to Sir Richard Stone. What does it matter to measure aggregate GDP, and to measure real GDP growth, and to measure real TFP growth, and to, to get it accurately? Well, it goes into all kinds of policies. Um, lots of times people are relating growth to policy, and I'm sure they're doing it right now. They're saying um, growth has been high in the United States the last couple of years. Maybe it's the Trump administration's policy of um, lowering barriers to, or lowering, you know, uh, reducing regulation or cutting taxes on, on companies. People are doing casual regressions in their mind all the time. Voters are doing that. So we better get the measurement right if, um, as approximate uh, uh, input to, to that kind of casual uh, empiricism. People are also saying the growth rate's falling because uh, um, it's just harder and harder to come up with innovations. People like Robert Gordon and Chad Jones, John Van Rien, and so on. Um, if growth, you know, isn't slowing down as much. We, did, we, we found we, could, we explained a tenth of the slowdown, but getting the measurement right is critical to saying, are we really running out of ideas? Is it getting harder and harder? Um, also, people are making comparisons like, you know, uh, people are, are having a higher standard of living than their parents. Getting the average growth rate right is critical to making that comparison. Um, so this number of, of only half of the people are better off than their parents, if we're missing half a percentage point of growth, that moves that number up to like 60% or better off. Um, the Fed's inflation target might be off. Um, indexing things could be off. Okay. Um, so in my remaining few minutes, I wanted to say, <coughs> I apologize for being so U.S.-centric in the, the, the data and the examples. It reflects my ignorance. Um, my, my ignorance isn't total, or my, my, my greatest area of familiarity. But my ignorance isn't total. I have some papers related to China, India, and Mexico. And um, so firms grow very differently in, in India and Mexico versus the U.S. This is a plot of a paper with Chen, I like it said Source World Bank. Um, the source was Chen, Chen Kai-she, and I have the paper. But um, I'm happy that, they're, that they produce a beautiful picture that the economists do. Um, OK, so this is age of the company, and this is their size relative to entrants were normalized to one. So in the U.S., firms basically grow or die. You can see firms that are like 30, 35 years old are 10 times bigger than the young firms. Um, in in uh, Mexico, they're twice as big, and in India, they're actually smaller. So this firm growth over the life cycle, I've been emphasizing incumbents in the U.S., that might be a U.S.-oriented number. Like, people started to fill in European countries, and they're generally in here. They're generally higher than Mexico, but lower than the U.S. So the U.S. may get disproportionate amounts of growth from surviving incumbents who, who succeed and do better and better. So this, this uh, big role for incumbents might not be a universal phenomenon. Um, so, but these issues, the methodology I'm describing can be applied anywhere. It can be applied to India, Mexico, China, I mentioned. Um, and then the growth problems, just because I was mentioning the non rivalry of ideas, uh, Richard Richard Stone's growth accounting methodology, or growth measurement, or GDP measurement methodology, can be applied everywhere. Well, the limits of it are also generally universal. So, these same quality measurement problems, especially for, pro for creative destruction instances, occur outside of the U.S. as well. So even though my examples for data are U.S. specific, I think the problems are more, more general. So last thing I'll, I'll say is I just wanted to, there's many open questions. This is an exciting area to do research in because the, the policy stakes and the welfare stakes are enormous. I think these are the most important questions in economics. So Richard Stone focused on aggregates and how to measure them because they are the most important numbers is what, what the averages do and the aggregates do. Um, so. There's many open questions like how big are externalities? I built into the whole methodology that people build on each other's ideas. All these quality ladders, that was building in knowledge externalities. We might be able to find that those were bigger for entrants than for incumbents, which would really be important for policy. Um, and yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks very much for listening. Q and A. The um, story about incumbents versus um, new entrants, as you indicated, may be complicated, at least in some industries, by incumbents acquiring new entrants beyond the pharmaceutical industry. And I wonder if you had any comments on the work uh, by Ashish Arora and his colleagues at Duke on what they call the division of innovative labor, with a lot of invention coming out of startups. And we're certainly seeing this in the IT industry. Uh, and by the digital giants, but the distribution and the commercialization being achieved by incumbents. Right. So, um, glad you mentioned that sheet. Went to grad school with that sheet. 
Um, so we actually included M&A activity here. Um, so it's true, like, like for example, the firm growth over the life cycle, about a third of that comes from um, mergers and acquisitions as opposed to organic growth. So I guess the key question is, like in your example, is that a form of innovation when they buy them up? Or, or is it, um, you know, are they, are they reforming? The, or I think in the spirit of Ashish's work, they're saying, those innovators were doing really important innovation and they were able to diffuse precisely because the big firms bought them. I think it's fair to say that this work doesn't doesn't do justice to that, but that could be a key mechanism by which uh, incumbents. So that's a that's a great area to refine the analysis and use data on these observed uh, acquisitions. Like do firms tend to grow faster after they require acquire one of these young gazelles? I just wanted to ask, you didn't talk at all about, you know, robots and how should we think about this assumption that growing labor or rising labor is going to be correlated with market share when we have, you know, industries like maybe, I don't know, you know, I don't even know where the labor saving technologies are being applied. But if you think about healthcare or something, if you're replacing nurses with computer programs that are helping to refine care in some way, what do we, how do we fit that? Maybe is this a big change that hasn't hit the economy yet in the way you're thinking about this? Like, are you thinking about, you know, in the past 40 years of labor saving technology, it was kind of in some steady way, so that contribution to growth we don't need to worry about? And does that mean, can we use this methodology going forward? So. Yeah, so, I mean, the first answer is I wish I had the sales data and the capital data, and in which case I wouldn't need to, we wouldn't need to assume employment was a proxy for market share. Um, for manufacturing, we can do that, and it actually looks pretty good. But um, I mean, I think it's totally right. Like labor share is falling, particularly in manufacturing. So, I guess I'm influenced by Ajumolu and Restrepo in thinking that robots have had an impact. Although I think their estimate is less than a million jobs. Less than a million. A million sounds really painful. A million jobs. Less than a million jobs in manufacturing in the U.S. lost to robots. And obviously, you could get into the details of how they estimate that, and whether that's a compelling estimate. Let's just say it is. Um, then that's you know like less than a seventh of the total decline, but but that that doesn't mean that um, that technological changes haven't been you know labor saving in general. So for, but but they look like the, if that's true, it looks like it's concentrated in manufacturing relative to the rest of the economy in the U.S. at least. In the U.S., um, the paper I'm going to talk about tomorrow is going to assume there was some decline in labor share, and that um, so we're going to argue it came from rising markups, but uh, automation is a competing story, and I guess. One of the difficulties with the automation story is you might have expected the investment rate to pick up, and it hasn't. But you know that's that's not entirely uh, dispositive. It's just one piece of evidence. But the other thing is that increasingly there are a number of studies chipping away at whether the U.S. labor share has actually fallen outside of manufacturing. No one seems to be saying it hasn't fallen in U.S. manufacturing. It seems to have fallen sharply there, and automation as well as outsourcing and imports may have played a major role there. But outside of manufacturing, people are chipping away at how measurements changes over time and arguing. You know, the rise of pass-through entities, uh, you know, compensation of, of, of executives um, have, are showing up as reductions in labor share, but are true reductions in labor share. So I think it's fair to say that if this is going to revolutionize uh, labor productivity, it might not have happened yet outside of manufacturing, um, but maybe it's been happening for, for years. I mean, that's one reaction to the automation story is that more broadly, capital labor substitution seems to have been happening for forever, like in, you know, um, farming for, for, for certain. Um, so it just seems like there's other forces that have offset that, and maybe even outside of manufacturing. But one thing I was going to say, I was going to say this to Oliver tomorrow too, I'm talking to him, um, is that I kind of have this conflicted view about automation and labor saving, which is on the one hand I want to embrace it just like the, the tractor, and, um, and that, that maybe it would free people up to do other things. On the other hand, it's ma potentially major distributional. Question. So there's part of it that wants to embrace it, and it's something that will expand the pie, but then the distributional questions could become huge. So I'm a conditional optimist uh, about that. I'm hoping it revolutionizes future labor productivity. Then all the we're running out of ideas stuff will be, somebody's wrong. Either we're running out of ideas, people, or the we're on the cusp of a labor productivity revolution. I hope the running out of ideas people are wrong, and we can handle the redistribution to make it close to parade or, or benefit the majority. Especially if so the majority vote for it, for allowing it. Uh, I want them to be helped, but also to allow it to happen. Another related thing that you said nothing about was inequality. 
And of course, you can't do everything in one talk. But you did mention Raj Chetty's work on whether this generation is better off than their parents. And you mentioned if we could recover some of the missing growth, we could boost his figure from 50% to 60%. But I thought his concern was not so much about how much growth we have, but the distribution of the fruits of that growth. And there must be an assumption about that in getting us from 50 to 60%. If it's in the wrong place, not clear that it will help us. Yeah, okay, that's totally fair. And it also, if it means, this is similar to the poverty line, moving people from $1.60 a day to $1.61 isn't necessarily a revolution. So being better off than your parents, but not as much better off as the, in the previous generation comparisons. But you're, I think you were mentioning also that it is still concentrated in the, in the rich. So Chad Jones and I, so you're right, I omitted inequality, which is obviously an important part of growth, especially, I, I just touched on it, which is that especially if there's a bunch of people who suffer as a byproduct of growth, Trade is one example that we're I mean, very well aware of, but technological change more generally. There's a lot of firms and workers who lose jobs, displace lower wages, and if the majority of people don't benefit from that, they might vote to stop it. So that we, I care about it both for what happens to average welfare, I'm very utilitarian, um, but also uh, what happens in the political economy if it means we have you know, actions to block trade or actions to block um, technological change. Um, this emphasis on creative destruction I didn't emphasize the destruction part. Um, the destruction part could increase inequality a lot and seems to have done so in the US recently. So one other thing I'll say though, is Chad Jones and I had this calculation. It's very imperfect though, even though I'll quote a number, then I'll criticize it right after saying it. So we said from behind the Rawlsian veil, not the max and min, but the, you know, if you don't know if you're gonna be rich or poor, rising inequality in the US is lowering ex-ante welfare. For, you know, if you have a mean preserving spread in your consumption across households, that lowers behind the veil average welfare. And so we asked how much? How much did that subtract growth, the growing inequality in the US? And we came up with a quarter of a percent per year. Now, I think that's too low, because that uses the consumer expenditure survey data, which has been criticized for understating the rise in consumption inequality. The rise in consumption inequality is much lower in that data than the rise in income inequality, and the complementary saving data does not, isn't compatible with that. So I think our, that number is probably too low by at least a factor of two. So that's an example, though. That's like saying if the U.S. economy is growing 2%, but where inequality is rising drastically, the true ex ante welfare equivalent growth rate might be significantly lower, which is totally fair. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.